Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 381, The Battle at Gazala. The waiting is all. Last time, Rommel was able to bluff and bluster General Ritchie's 8th Army into backing up to the Gazala line, just ahead or west of Tobruk. Of course, Ritchie had to abandon the Cyrenaic and Bulge, and now Axis planes based there would harass Malta. But the Allied response, that is Operation Acrobat, was forming up. Hopefully, this would be the final push west for the British-led forces in the desert. And yet, what if Operation Acrobat or any other offensive was launched and failed? If Rommel won a clash of tanks, then there was nothing stopping him from moving on to Egypt, and the new government there under Nahas Pasha, who seemed pro-Axis, or at least believed they would win in the end, indicated that the British Eighth Army may have adversaries on either side of them. Caution was the watchword of the day. On the other side, the Germans were arguing about the best way to win in this theater, as if it was already a foregone conclusion. Grand Admiral Eric Rader wanted Malta taken. The British had already moved away their surface ships and submarines from the island, as it was simply no longer safe due to the daily bombings. But arguing against this was Kesselring and Rommel. They wanted to brook. Why? If it fell, Rommel could use it as his base to invade Egypt. Supplies could come in from Crete, and Malta could be bombed, but ignored. No more supply headaches for the Desert Fox. In the end, Hitler, still thinking about his losses on Crete, sided with Rommel and Kesselring, much to the anger of the German Navy and the Italians. Tobruk would fall, and then on to Egypt. But, as we have previously covered, Berlin wanted Tobruk to fall by June 20th, for that's when the second German Air Force had to return to the Eastern Front. And Rommel was not to go beyond the port city without direct permission from der Fuhrer. On the other side, a war was about to start that would end with the end of Auchinleck at C&C Middle East. Back in February, Churchill wrote to the CNC that, according to his calculations, 8th Army should already have a tank and plane superiority over Rommel. Why was he waiting to attack? Auchinleck carefully and thoughtfully replied, explaining why he could not move out before June. There was more to desert fighting than just the number of vehicles at one's command. But when the eager Churchill read this note, the first actual atomic detonation occurred in his head. Incensed, the Prime Minister wrote a letter with phrases like, Soldiers are meant to fight, and armies are not intended to stand around doing nothing. It got worse from there. Fortunately, C&C Home Forces General Brooke stepped in and stopped this missive from going out. Instead, the response read along the lines of, Please reconsider your answer. A few weeks later in March, the Prime Minister asked Auchinleck to come home to better explain himself. The second Churchillian explosion occurred when Auchinleck replied, No, it was not a good time for me to leave my post. And he was right. But Churchill's request was not a request. It only looked that way. Was he the bloody Prime Minister or not? Auchinleck counterproposed, that General Brooke and Chief of Air Staff Charles Porter come to Cairo to see firsthand the why of Auchinleck's refusal to move out before June. Churchill countered the counter by saying, or I could just sack you now, but he was talked out of this. In the end, the compromise was that Sir Stafford Cripps, the Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal and the Vice Chief of the General Staff, General Nye, would stop by Cairo on their way to India to talk to the Congress Party and Muslim League. Information would be gathered and eventually taken back to London. There would be a third Churchillian explosion when the envoys agreed with Auchinleck, which should come as no surprise, but as the CNC Middle East agreed to a mid-May attack instead of June, the Prime Minister was mollified. Barely. And then it all came unraveled. At the moment, with the mid-May attack agreed to, the Royal Navy would orchestrate a supply run to Malta that same month during the moonless period. 
Hopefully, this would result in a one-two punch on Rommel, attacking him with the 8th Army, while resources based on Malta strangled his supply line. But then, Auchinleck heard of the threat now hanging over India, thanks to a CNC's report. As we have previously seen, General Vinegar Joe Stilwell had been forced out of Burma, as had the British-led forces, and the Chinese troops, who had done stellar work, were now back in China, waiting to be attacked themselves. This combined with the idea of Japanese surface vessels closing off the Red Sea supply route, clearly that area needed all the men, planes, and tanks it could get hold of. Which is when Auchinleck said, take mine, I'm not eager to attack anyways, yet. Then he sent a message to London that said, when the American General Grant medium tanks show up, along with the expected arrival of British six-pounder anti-tank guns, this would give the 8th Army only a 2 to 3 numerical superiority over the Germans, but he would still be only on par with the Italians. So, to his thinking, he was back to attacking during June's moonless period. But if the Italians managed to send the Littorio Armored Division and have it rush to the front, well, then he was looking at August to attack. This time, however, Churchill did not explode. The impetuous, aged warrior took a back seat to Winston, the diplomat, who could be just as deadly. Instead of screaming on paper, the Prime Minister replied, in part, Yes, we know the risks. By we, I mean myself, the Chiefs of Staff, the Defense Committee, and the War Cabinet, who think you should attack Rommel ASAP. We are prepared to take full responsibility for these general directions. And then the politician ended with, In this, you will no doubt have regard to the fact that the enemy may himself be planning to attack you early in June. But the various commanders in the area rejected this and said as much. They also added, Malta is not that important. Besides, let Rommel attack. It's easier to defend anyways. Just wipe out his armor, and the desert fox will go scurrying back to his hole. To this, the British chiefs of staff had had enough. They replied, attack by the June dark period, or get ready to pack your things. And yet all this was for nothing. For just before the chiefs of staff delivered their ultimatum, the British intelligence staffs had received solid proof that Rommel had his own attack plan to retake Tobruk near the end of May. With this new information, all those who spoke with the British accent were suddenly on the same page. Build up a massive defensive line and smash the bastard when he comes this way. Based on the true story that shocked the world. I come. Critics are calling A Spy Among Friends on MGM Plus a thrilling new Cold War drama. Treason. That's what I'm accusing you of. With spellbinding performances. I am not a traitor! Starring Emmy Award winners Damian Lewis and Guy Pearce. You're trying to get me killed. Give me one reason why not. I lonesome. A Spy Among Friends. Watch now, only on MGM+. If the story so far has failed to confuse and frustrate you, try this on for size. During Rommel's recent offensive, General Ritchie's plan was, when building up the Gazala line, something that was to be temporary, and he would hold it as long as he could. But behind him, the real defensive line would be at the Egyptian border, and that was being strengthened at the moment. Then Ritchie would have the 8th Army fall behind that line and abandoning Tobruk. But when Rommel stopped, the Gazala line would be the place where the access were to be held up. How? By the massive supplies coming in and from which they would launch Operation Acrobat. As for Tobruk... That's where those massive amounts of supplies were going to, and they were distributed. So far, so good. But when word of Rommel's coming attack came in, the plan was suddenly not good enough. The Gazala line was not an ideal location for a strong defensive line, and suddenly all those supplies in Tobruk and nearby being moved around thanks to the rail lines put down by the New Zealand rail engineers were now in front of the new real defensive line the Egyptian border. Should the Gazala line fall, as many on the Allied side thought it would, 
In other words, much of their supplies were now in front of the Egyptian defensive line, accessible to Rommel, if he broke through the Gazala line. Another change allowed by the time gained, waiting for Rommel to attack, was to correct a mistake noticed during Operation Crusader. The armored division, with two armored brigades and a support group, was just too unwieldy. No, something along the German line was seen as superior. That being, for one, the brigade group would now be the basic fighting formation for the British. Not a division, and there would be three types of brigade groups. An armored brigade with three tank regiments, a motor brigade with three motorized infantry battalions, and an infantry brigade with three infantry battalions, and all these groups would have their own field artillery, anti-tank and anti-aircraft artillery, along with engineers and logistics units. Flexible and more could always be added on, but easy enough on their own to move around in the desert. Another element that Auchinleck and Ritchie were hoping to take advantage of was the rolling in of American medium General Grant tanks, or M3s. When they first crossed the Atlantic, the British went over them with a fine-tooth comb. Because just after Pearl Harbor, when Washington realized they needed to ramp up their tank production, clearly the existing tanks were not going to cut it, in the fields of France nor in the deserts of North Africa. Specifically, the latest tank plan, really a wooden mock-up, had too high of a profile. Its hull was riveted, its armor was too thin, and each tank needed its own radio. But there was little time for improvements. Perhaps all these could be added on later. Either way, the first grants to come over pleased the British officers overall. The tanks going to the British were called Grants. The ones that stayed in America were called Lees. The Grants spots in the extension on the side held a 75mm field gun, whereas the British Crusader tank had a 40mm gun and thinner armor. Also on board the Grants were 37mm guns with solid anti-tank ammunition and Browning machine guns. London also liked the armor and how reliable the Grant was during tests and it would be tested even more in North Africa. But there would be moments of failure, as the Grant was not meant to be the main tank along the entire front. But with Britain's needs, tanks for Europe, tanks for Africa, tanks for Asia, the Grant would be playing a solid role in this upcoming combat. Doing the best he could with what he had, Ritchie gave each regiment a squadron or two of Grants. As for the anti-tank guns, the Allies were in less solid shape here. The British six-pounders were in very limited supply, and these were given to the Royal Artillery Anti-Tank Units, which makes sense, and these units gave their two-pounders to the infantry battalions, so they could have some defense against the Panzers and Italian tanks. But there were only enough six-pounders for the 1st and 7th Armored Division's brigade groups. As for the shells, well, too few of them had arrived by May. With the formation of troops worked out to be centered around brigade groups, the Gazala line was based on infantry brigade group boxes. Each box had wire and mines around it, and a few had a Matilda or Crusader tank within it. But the bulk of these were in reserve, waiting for their moment to counterattack. Closest to the coast, Major General Daniel Pinar's 1st South African Division lied in wait, broken into three defensive boxes, with the 1st Brigade along the coast, the 2nd Brigade just below them, and the 1st Brigade just below them. See episode cover map. Just below the 1st South African Division was Major General William Havelock Ramsden's 50th Northumbrian Division, and it too had three boxes, lined up below the South African Division. The two most northern boxes of the 151st Brigade and the 69th Brigade were close enough to support each other, whereas the third box, Brigadier Hayden's 150th Brigade, was five miles further south. The overall line had to be stretched out to keep up with the enemy. There had to be gaps somewhere, and this was one of them. After the 150th Brigade, there was nothing but wire for 10 miles, 
Well, that and plenty of mines. It was a sea of mines, and some of these had been taken from Tobruk, as it was deemed that defensive line would no longer have to worry about holding back Rommel. At the bottom of the Gazala line at Bir Hachem were the Free French Brigade Group, under the command of General Koenig. Again, as the days went by, more mines were laid, which made the men feel better. But the bulk of mines were to be buried on either side of the 150th Brigade near the center of the line, as it had a five-mile gap to its north and a ten-mile gap to its south. To be sure, on a map, the dots representing the minefields, or mine marshes as they were starting to be called, was far from a perfect tank trap. First, the mines were laid out far enough to allow passage, if one knew where to look. But as the British would find out, not having enough men with the right weapons close by to harass someone trying to go through the minefield would hurt them, and they would realize they did not have enough anti-personnel mines as well, which meant someone could tiptoe in at night and remove the mines if they had the testicular fortitude. Behind the main line were other boxes and positions meant to harass the enemy, but also to make sure that they did not come in any other way besides the west. Along the coast, there were units looking out for any amphibious landings. Just below the coastal defenses and behind the South African division, there were two forts, Commonwealth Keep and Akroma Keep. The Akroma was just outside the Tobruk perimeter, and there all of the men and guns were surrounded by mines. Even if the enemy landed on the coast, they would have a hell of a time coming south. If a line was to be drawn from west to east, roughly in the center of the defensive line, then on the northern side would be General Herbert Lumsden's 1st Armored Division, with the 1st Army Tank Brigade behind the Indians, and the 2nd Armored Brigade to the southeast of them. Below the dissection would be Messervy's 7th Armored Division, filling in behind the 10-mile gap, and the 4th Armored Brigade was to the southeast of the Free French, should any Axis tanks come this way and try to come around and then sweep north to head for Tobruk. Due south of Tobruk, just below El Abden, sat the 13th Corps headquarters of Acting Lieutenant General William Gott. South of this was General Norrie's 30th Corps headquarters, and just in front of both of these was Lumsden's 1st Armored Division headquarters. Each brigade group had tank support behind it, and also further back, to offer up a counter-thrust should Rommel's planned attack fail or slow down. And then time, the worst enemy a bored soldier could have, visited them. When would Rommel attack? What more could we do to protect our position and the line overall? For Auchinleck made it clear to 8th Army Commander Ritchie, everything was on the line. Don't fear Rommel. Defeat him. But if we lose, save your fear from the Prime Minister. He will have all of our heads. On May 16th, Ritchie sent out his defensive battle plan. If Rommel hits close to the coastline, he would have to deal with two brigade group boxes with their own artillery and tanks, and they were close enough to each other to support each other. If the enemy came to the far south, they would have the free French, mines, and allied armor to deal with. And if they aimed for the center, well, thousands of mines waited for their tanks and trucks. For almost every British officer was convinced If Rommel's tanks could be taken away from him, then he would turn tail and have to wait for another group of tanks from Italy. Given his options, Auchinleck felt that Rommel would make an armored wedge backed by infantry, artillery, and air cover and smash through the center along a narrow front, meanwhile having the Italians swing wide south to keep the free French pinned down, as well as the armored units behind them. To this, Auchinleck told Ritchie, be as sure as you can before you commit your armor. If we get this wrong, Egypt is in trouble. As for the attack plan, General Norrie of the 30th Corps agreed with Auchinleck. The attacks would come at the center and southern end. But Ritchie felt that the southern end was his real threat. That's where Rama would come in 
and strength. As this was his thinking, he ignored advice from Auchinleck, though Ritchie did make sure that Lumsden and Messervy were well-suited and equipped. Though the summer heat was building, the men of the 8th Army were confident. They believed they had worked out a way to dash Rommel's hopes in his tanks, and they had worked out several counter-thrusts once the enemy was bogged down. What with the well-armed brigade boxes giving them hell? One colonel wrote, wouldn't the Hun in his Mark III and IVs get a shock when the 75 millimeters came in? This episode is brought to you by Dave. When you need money in a pinch, Dave can help. It's a banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly. No interest, late fees, or credit check. Join the millions already using Dave to get financial relief and sign up for an extra cash account to get up to $500 instantly. Go to dave.com slash Spotify or download the Dave app now. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. However, on the other side of the Gazala line, there sat Rommel with total mastery. Of course, this was possible as he ignored the yelling of his superiors and demanded absolute loyalty from those below him. But as time would show, the Desert Fox was not all that clever. He was hardworking and he pushed his men, but a tactician? Well, he would find out. Rommel, because of his dynamic personality, rarely sat still, but he should have realized before his attack on Gazala that his previous battles had grown from raids, to be sure raids that he devised, but his enemy was already confounded by the time he started a general engagement. In other words, he was a great improviser. But this, this would be a major attack from the start, a horse of a different color. Rommel had already decided on his attack plan. He would hold the South Africans down to the north with probing raids. Added to this, there was to be a small amphibious landing above and behind them. Between these two moves, the British were sure to focus on the north. And with enough armor committed to this, what came next should surprise them. With all or most Allied eyes looking north, the Africa Corps, the Italian 20th Mobile Corps, and the 90th Light Division with reconnaissance units would faint towards the center of the line. But as they got closer, they would swing south and make for the French. From there, the Italian 20th Corps, the most northern of these three armored columns, would sweep in just below where the minefield ended, but just above the Free French position. Next, the Africa Corps would go further south and smash right into the Free French. Rommel did not expect them to resist uh, more than an hour. And when they crumbled, Africa Corps would make for Ancrona, one of those defensive boxes in the rear. But to get that far, obviously, several defending armor units of the British would have to have already been roughed up. This left the southernmost column, the 90th Light Division, to dash to a point just east of El Adem on the Trig Cabuzo, again just due south of Tobruk. Yet the defenders would think that the 90th Light would actually be more than what it was. Why? Because Rommel put airplane engines on the back of trucks that would blow up sand as they moved along, making the Light Division seem more than it was. With all this done, the defender's line would either be smashed, contained, or in retreat, depending on that section of the line. And Tobruk would already be threatened, even before the bulk of Rommel's forces could get that far east. With much of Rommel's armor heading south to get into the rear positions of the Allied troops, once the enemy's tanks were scattered and the Desert Fox expected 24 hours would be enough, some of the panzers would then turn west. That is, they would do an about-face and hit the 1st South African Division from the rear. With the defenses so in tatters, the attack on Tobruk would begin and end. Rommel gave the entire enterprise four days, which is why all of his men were expected to carry four days' worth of ammunition and supplies. The man clearly thought little of his enemy's abilities, and he would be half right. When the armor clashed, the gun sounded, and the men started spilling their blood on the unforgiving sand 
Rommel would find that the leading Allied officers were nothing to write home about. But those men fighting under them? They came to fight. But before the clash could begin, it's important to remember a few things. After all, that's why warriors study war, to avoid the mistakes of others. It would turn out that though the Axis intelligence knew much of Allied dispositions in the Middle East in general, when it came to the Eighth Army, they missed a lot, which means Rommel's plan was faulty. After all, his intelligence section missed the following. An armored brigade group, an army tank brigade, and three infantry brigade groups, not to mention the 150th Brigade group stationed 10 miles above the Free French, who were at the bottom nor that there was a sea of mines on either side of the 150th. Beyond this, the British knew, almost to the day, when Rommel would attack, so the element of surprise never existed. And on May 25th, the day before battle was given, here's how the two sides stacked up. Medium tanks for the defenders, made up of 167 Grants and 257 Crusader tanks, a total of 424, compared to Rommel's 282 Panzer III and IVs, though mostly of the former. In terms of light tanks, the British-led forces had 276 I tanks, or Matildas, and 149 Steward tanks, for an overall tank total of 849, versus the 560 of Rommel's, that being 228 Italian medium tanks and 50 Panzer IIs. As for the fighting above the ground, General Ritchie would have 929 aircraft, 190 in the active area, and another 749 that could be called upon, whereas Rommel had 1,497 planes, 497 in the area, and another 1,000 he could call upon. All this means is that Ritchie had a 2 to 1 superiority over the Germans and was on par with the Italians on the ground, and Auchinleck had said, that's exactly what we need to win. Further, as the Allies would be on the defensive, their numbers should have counted for more, given the relative weakness of their air arm. In the end, Rommel knew he was going to smash the enemy, while the British fully expected that the defenses they had in place would de-armor the Desert Fox, quick smart, the waiting was all. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, again, I would just like to say hello to my latest members. Uh, James Reese from Waipahu in Hawaii. Yeah, I should have looked that up, James. Sorry about that. Stephen Oswalt from Austin, Texas. And Daniel uh, Kopanke from Cincinnati, Ohio. And as far as donations, there's a Jason Gardner who also attached a lovely message and made my day. Jason, thank you very much. We will see you as soon as we can with the battle at Gazala Line. Nature's always finding ways to support life, like elderberries. Nature's Way extracted the best of the berry, tossed in vitamins C and D and zinc, and put them into Sambuca's gummies. Powerful immune support inspired by nature. Nature's Way.